Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I want to get before we start, I'd like to give a little bio on both Mary Frances and John. Uh, Mary Frances is executive director of our local branch of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, otherwise known as NAMI. After completing her bachelor's degree at Santa Clara University and a master's from Johns Hopkins University School of Public Health, she held positions in hospital administration in New York City and then in Chicago. Professionally, Mary Frances became very familiar with the challenges of meeting mental health needs in a community-based hospital when serving as administra administrative director of psychiatric services in a Chicago city hospital. Personally, she became familiar with the impact of mental illness on families when losing her father unexpectedly to suicide, which eventually introduced her to NAMI and its programs. NAMI Sonoma County helps people affected by mental illness personally or as family members to build better lives through education, support, and connectedness. For the past 40 years, this nonprofit has provided pre-classes, support groups, a warm line, and presentations that raise awareness and advocate for access to care for all throughout Sonoma County. Our co-presenter today is <clears throat> Chief John Cregan. John has uh, 25 years of law enforcement experience and was appointed Chief of Police in Santa Rosa in July of 2022. Wow, it's been almost two years. Um, as an officer, Chief Cregan worked multiple specialty assignments, which included motorcycle officer, hostage negotiator, gang crimes detective, field training officer, and he taught both the GREAT program and the DARE program in elementary schools. Chief Cregan later served as a gang crimes team sergeant and then lieutenant in charge of the investigation bureaus. He spent three years as captain managing both investigations and field services before being promoted to the chief of police. Uh, John serves on the board of directors for NAMI and is passionate about creating long-term solutions to help police officers better serve those suffering from mental illness in our communities. He led the efforts to reimagine the city of Santa Rosa's mental health response model and create the In Response program, which launched in 2021. John holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice administration and a master's degree in law enforcement and public safety. Chief Cregan is also a graduate of uh, California Police Officer Standards and Training Command College and Leadership Santa Rosa program. Um, so once again, um, I want to reiterate what Leona said. If you have questions during the presentations, if you go ahead and put them in the chat, then I can moderate those. Um, but with that, uh, Mary Francis and John, take it away. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to share my slides. Thanks for having us. Um, and Mary Francis is going to put the PowerPoint up, and we're going to kind of jointly go through the presentation together. She's going to start us off. Right. Okay. So uh, thanks again. Um, so just what I thought we're going to cover today, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about the changes that the history of change in how behavioral health crises are responded to. Um, you know, it's there's been a slow evolution in which we are moving away from law enforcement first, the, being the first responders to some form of behavioral health response. Um, I think that um, Chief Cragen is going to talk about what has happened here in Santa Rosa through the In Response Mental Health Support Team, which has taken the response even further. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's happened to increase access to behavioral health crisis response throughout the county. So I just want to start by saying, what do I mean by a behavioral health crisis? And uh, some of you may well know this, but the term behavioral health means it includes both mental health and substance use disorder treatment. So um, that we're seeing increasingly a move toward that term as opposed to mental health. Um, and that's because for years, historically, tre treatment 
for mental health issues and behavior and substance use issues have been divided for by payer systems and even approaches. And we're increasingly working toward a system which uh, addresses both, not expecting somebody to take care of their substance use disorder problems before they get mental health treatment or the reverse, which has often been the case in the United States. Anyway, so these are just types of behavior. Um, you know, it could be actively thinking about suicide. It can be erratic behavior that we see on the streets. It can be somebody who has experienced psychosis. Um, it can be an overdose from any form of substance. Um, it can be intoxication from alcohol or just somebody who is extremely withdrawn, uh, meaning they may be in a suicidal crisis, I believe. Of course, it doesn't want to move. Hmm. Um, so just what has been behind, uh, you know, across the country, a lot of attention being focused on how we respond to crises um, and why the drivers of change. And so although, um, you know, this statistics go back to 2014, which are the latest available from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, there was a long period of time in which there was a very high risk if someone called 911 in relationship to somebody at home or in the workplace having a mental health crisis and police showed up or sheriffs showed up uh, armed, um, there was a high fatality rate. There was a high risk uh, because decisions were made very quickly uh, in an instant. And um, many people lost their lives or were injured or ended up in jail as a, res as, as a result of law enforcement responding to a mental health crisis. Um, and uh, in particular, there was a disproportionate impact on people of color um, among those fatal shootings. I think the Black Lives Matter uh, movement um, brought about increased attention across the United States about law concerns about law enforcement response. Um, and it's it's left many people, you know, of color who are very anxious about the idea of calling 911 for help in the, um, let's say they have a family member who's experienced a mental health crisis. And John, I want you to feel free to chime in. Of course. Um, um, and so I think it's important to just point out that somebody in great distress from uh, a mental health situation it is not always a threat to public safety. Um, sometimes they are, and I think we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, often that is not the case. So another major driver of change has just been uh, what's happened in our hospital emergency departments, which are overcrowded, um, always long waits, and they have become increasingly very high-tech environments. Um, it, appropriately for people experience a medical care crisis. Um, but that means that the staff do not always have the time or the ability or even uh, the knowledge to appropriately respond to somebody who is in a mental, experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, most hospital emergency departments don't necessarily have somebody right at their ready to respond in terms of a psychiatric consultation. You have to wait for the psychiatrist on call. We have a shortage of psychiatrists or psych and psychologists and clinical social workers across the country, across California and here in Sonoma County as well. Um, if it's determined after an assessment that the person needs more intensive care, let's say they need to be transferred to a psychiatric hospital or to a general hospital with a psychiatric unit, um, they can wait hours, they can wait days because there are inadequate places to send people to. Um, so all of that is very often a very traumatic experience. Sometimes patients in mental health crises are can be strapped to a gurney. Uh, they can be left in uh, a, a room on their own because the, the emergency department staff are not comfortable with knowing exactly how to interact with them, how to care 
That doesn't mean that our hospitals don't. I know that Kaiser has uh, mental health counselors on call and available um, during many hours around the clock, but um, not every hospital emergency department does, even here in Sonoma County. Um, I know that often they will, while somebody has to wait for a transfer to a more appropriate kind of care, um, they often, uh, we have security guards or, um, you know, sitters will stay with the person, but they're just isolated. It's, it's often a very scary experience for people in crisis. Anyway, all of this um, contributes to just what we see cycling in and out of our jail, cycling in and out of psychiatric hospitalizations and homelessness, uh, because we don't have adequate levels of care for mental health crises. And we, we don't truly have a continuum of care. Um, so just um, shortly, one of the other drivers have been the numbers of people living with a mental illness who are booked into our jail. Um, in here in Sonoma County, 40 to 40, I, I see different estimates. I'm actually working with a group called the Stepping Up Initiatives in which we're trying to identify people with serious mental illness in the jail to actually get firm numbers because that 40 to 47%, and sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's like half of everybody in the jail, the focus really what we'd like to be on are people with serious mental illness. So people for whom mental illness is so severe that they just cannot function in their day-to-day -day life. Um, it's not somebody with who simply identify with um, depression or anxiety or something that doesn't interfere with their ability to function. Um, I Suicide deaths, I'm on the Suicide Coalition for Sonoma County, which, which is working on a, a countywide plan. And in the last few years, there have been around 75 suicide deaths per year. And so because there's an estimate that for every person that actually dies by suicide, there's an, there are another 25 people who have attempted suicide. That's where I got the 1900 per year um, here in Sonoma County. And overdose deaths uh, take time to be documented, um, but I know they're climbing um, and I'm sure John can second that. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, a as of the first 11 months for which we have confirmed statistics in 2022, there had been 74 deaths. And mental health crisis calls to 911. I don't have a number for Sonoma County, and I don't know, John, if there is a number for the overall number of calls related to mental health crisis calls. Do you know? We're trying to track that more appropriately, and that's been one of the things within response of us being a better way. So countywide, certainly not. For the Santa Rosa Police Department, we are working to be able to track those and get a better call volume of what percentage of our calls are related to mental health calls. So um, one of the big drivers has been SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration of the United States, talking about the need for a continuum of care and crisis response. So what they say is that anybody experiencing a mental health or behavioral health crisis, excuse me, really needs someone to talk to. And from SAMHSA's perspective, the majority of people who need are in that position that talking to somebody who is skilled at crisis response can handle a majority of the calls. For those that can't be handled over the phone, um, they need someone to come to them, whatever they are. So uh, you'll see here the phrase under a bridge, at school, at work, at home, uh, even in the booking area of a jail, someone to go and that we're talking about a mobile crisis team of crisis responders. And then some place to go is the third element, just people who do need more intense support. So people for whom the mobile crisis team and a phone call are just simply not gonna be enough. They need a place to be seen, to be assessed, to be stabilized. And if more intensive care is needed, they need a place to be able to go, to find a bed. And so there are three 
this is a bit repetitive, but basically these are three core elements of what a what a well-functioning crisis care system should look like. Um, number one, call centers should be 24-7. The people answering those phone calls need to be trained um, and handle a wide range of crises, um, including behavioral health, mental health, and substance use, um, and perhaps homeless calls or, or, or calls from somebody experiencing homelessness. Um, they should be able to connect to local, serv local services. Um, they should have the ability to dispatch a mobile crisis team if that's needed, and ideally be able to know things like who has an open bed or which emergency department in the community could take somebody and where's our crisis stabilization unit at? Can they accept another person? Um, and the ideal, according to Samson, is that the mobile crisis teams would be dispatched in about 10 to 20% of all calls, not for every call. And in terms of mobile crisis teams, I mean, their goal is to de-escalate a crisis, um, to take the time to develop a trust with that person in crisis, to get them to be comfortable in accepting help and support. And one of the important things they, that, that, that mobile crisis teams are trained to do is identify a person's strengths and who are their natural supports? Who can they call upon or what could they do to help themselves de-escalate and uh, not get to the point of needing intensive psych services? Um, it's meant to be collaborative. So they don't just, they're working with that person to help that person take an active role in their own self-care when it's possible. Um, and I think you'll find that um, in response, one of the roles that they can do, help with is just getting a person to, to an emergency department, if that's what's needed, help them get to a place of care um, rather than the back of a police car. Um, and then finally, a crisis stabilization. We do have the county crisis stabilization unit. I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm looking at, I can't read all my writing because I'm looking at people. Um, anyway, um, the crisis stabilization unit is an alternative to a hospital emergency department. It's um, in even our own crisis stabilization unit, which is operated by the county over on Challenger Way, was intentionally designed to look more like a living room setting. If you look at the furniture, um, I don't think they can operate always in a casual living room type environment because of the numbers of people that they're seeing and sometimes the intensity of the crisis that they're handling. But but the goal is to have an alternative to um, an emergency department in a hospital that is unlike the hospital setting. So it's a place where people can calm down, a pay, be de-escalated. Um, where there's peer support support available. Um, ideally, a crisis stabilization unit should be a place that can handle detoxification needs. Um, and ideally, uh, it's a place where there's absolutely no rejection of anybody that law enforcement takes in. So not requiring a law enforcement official to spend 45 minutes or an hour checking in a person, but a crisis stabilization unit that functions well, accepts them, takes them in, determines what they need, and lets law enforcement get back to whatever they need to be doing in the community. But all of those, meeting those standards is still not something that's realized in many U.S. communities. One of the places that does it very well, actually, Arizona, surprisingly, both Phoenix and Tucson have quite robust systems of crisis care. And they're really doing this quite well in terms of zero rejection for law enforcement drop-offs. And they have crisis care centers that can take the full spectrum of needs from letting somebody spend time to um, de detox from, um, from alcohol, for example. Let's go to the next slide. And of course my computer is frozen <laughs> and I don't know why. Oh, I see, okay. I'm so sorry. 
Oh my gosh. I may have to, I'm sorry about this. I may have to stop sharing and then um, let me stop share and go back to it. Okay. It's a good idea. Sorry. No worries. It's technology. <laughs> Okay, trying one more time. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about 988, which was uh, enacted by Congress in July 2022. So it replaces the former crisis and suicide prevention hotlines only in the sense that that used to be a 10 digit number that people had to remember what all 10 digit. 10 digits were. It's meant to be a deliberately simple number that anybody from anywhere in the United States can call. Um, and today you can 24 seven, you can call this number, text this number, or you can go online to 988 Lifeline and chat. Um, everybody that responds is a trained crisis counselor. Um, and they're truly meant not only to respond to calls from people who are in crisis. But if you are trying to figure out how to support somebody that you're with in crisis or worried about, they are just as available to the person looking to help somebody else. Um, there are about 200 call centers across the country. Buckaloo Programs is operating a call center that does respond to calls from local area codes in Sonoma County, but calls get routed to a call center based upon your phone uh, area code. So I have a Connecticut mobile crisis area code, and not mobile crisis, but mobile phone number code. So it, if I were to use that, I would not necessarily be directed to somebody in Sonoma County. This is an issue they're trying to work on because the ideal response is connecting with somebody should you need additional services, somebody that is familiar with your local services. That's the ideal. Um, so 988, there was no federal funding. Um, so out of the uh, totality of US states, California is one of seven that has enacted, enacted startup and ongoing funding for 988. Um, and um, there is, uh, through this legislation, um, the Congress approved the possibility of adding on a charge to your local phone bills to support the cost of operating this system, but each state had to individually determine whether or not they would approve an individual fee or not. So right now, California, I think it was last summer, approved a 30 cent per month charge on your phone bills, and that goes to support 988 calls. Compare that with $3 a month for 911 calls. But there are many states that have not yet done either. They haven't enacted funding for 988, and they haven't approved um, a charge on phone bills to support the system. Um, so 988 is not perfect. It's still being built out. Um, but the reason why I think that's important is that our own mobile crisis response teams here in Sonoma County also are being built out. Um, this is just a poll conducted with um, a national polling company and NAMI. I mean, there is just high community support across the country saying people do want to see better crisis care, even though we know that there are subsections of our population and community for whom we need to do a better job. Um, there's been a lot of concern about whether or not if you call 988, um, you're, they're automatically being, you know, they could call 911 and have a law enforcement team sent out to you. And that's just not the case. 988 centers don't have that, uh, that uh, information about a person's location. If they wanted to connect somebody with law enforcement because they were truly concerned about an active suicidal ideation, they would have to get that person's consent and work with them to know where they are. Um, and just by contrast, it took 30 years plus or minus to build out the whole 911 system, which is astonishing in hindsight. So we have made relatively remarkable progress in transforming how we respond, 
respond to mobile crisis teams. Um, and here, I just wanted to reiterate the point that mobile crisis response is always going to have to work hand in hand with law enforcement um, because there are situations in which there is a weapon involved, uh, for example, or the situation, you know, our mobile crisis teams are not expected to go out and be endangered in their life. But I think it works quite well here in Sonoma County. And I'm going to turn this over to John in just a moment. Um, I just want to say that this chart is something that we created here at NAMI Sonoma County because we have. Um, a variety of mobile crisis teams in the, in the county. So we just created this um, to represent who to call based upon where you live. So you can see why it's going to be wonderful if we get to a point where there's going to be a single number to call uh, in, in Sonoma County. And these teams are not all the same. They are staffed in different ways. Some teams can do what we call a 5150. So that's um, assessing somebody for an involuntarily involuntary hold. Um, some teams cannot. And communities behind these teams have made decisions about what, what they want their mobile crisis teams to look like. I'm going to, so John, I'm going to turn this over and talk about the in response model. Great. So thank you so much, Mary Frances. And as everyone can see, Mary Frances is, is really the subject matter expert for Sonoma County on, on our complex mental health systems and kind of what the problem is and kind of what are some of the best practices. And, and she was such a key partner in helping us create our in response team. And that happened for us in uh, 2020, we started this. And that's when there was a moment of national reckoning about what are we going to do and we uh, came together as a city and our city leaders said, hey, let's come up with a plan. Uh, I was a captain at the time and kind of jumped at the opportunity to be able to be a part of this. And we started out, we had heard a lot about him. So I'm sure some have heard about the CAHOOTS program in Eugene, Oregon. And CAHOOTS stands for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Streets. And it was really, they're ahead of their time in Eugene. They actually formed in 1989 and had this civilian model working very closely with the Eugene Police Department so uh, we were one of the first uh, agencies in the country to actually sign a working agreement with Kahoot. So we paid them to be able to have like insight to their team, to be able to get their policies, their practices, their procedures. I met with their team dozens of times, including even like their uniforms, their vehicle layouts. And at the end of the day, and I made close friends with some of the Kahoot's people, I tell them like, we really took like the foundation of what they were doing well in Eugene, and we made it that much better for the city of Santa Rosa. So we put some key things with our team and uh, we call it the CAHOOTS Plus model with it. And CAHOOTS, they don't actually have licensed mental health clinicians, but that was something that was really important for us to be able to actually have that level of expertise because that was one of the main problems we were trying to solve because quite frankly, police officers don't have a lot of training and experience on mental health crisis. They get most of their experiences like on the job of learning as they go, not through the police academy, not through our training programs, we do send our officers to a 36 hour like crisis intervention course and Mary Francis helps teach that course with NAMI, but that's a drop in the bucket for what they need. The licensed mental health clinicians actually have a, a bachelor's degree in a related field, a master's degree, 3000 clinical hours of field work, and then still certified by the California Board of Behavioral Science. So they get a vast amount of experience that they go through. Another thing we really examined is a paramedic versus an EMT, and some teams don't even have an EMT. They have what they call like a first aid clinician or someone who has some basic first aid skills. We wanted a paramedic on our team because the paramedic can do a higher level of treatment in the field. And we want it there for low level injuries, whether they be self harm injuries or working with our unsheltered population. And we wanted to, as much as we can, handle those calls ourselves and divert them from ever going to our local emergency rooms. Another thing, too, I met with teams across the country, and some of the main teams that we worked with, in addition to Cahoots, was the STAR team in Denver, the Portland Street Response team, the REACH team in Dallas, Texas. And I met with each one of those teams and kind of talked about what they were doing. And the STAR team in uh, Denver had started about a year before us, and they were seeing over 60% of their calls that their mental health team was going to were homeless related. Uh, so that's why we work closely with Catholic Charities here in Santa Rosa, and we added a homeless outreach specialist to our team. So we have 
driving in one multidisciplinary team. It's the licensed mental health clinician, a fire paramedic, and a homeless outreach specialist. That those three are riding together. We're going to show some pictures in a minute with it. And then they're supported, though. And this is another thing that I really want to drive home is we have what we call like the cycle of psychosis. And these individuals continue the cycle. They get the help. They get some brief stabilization. They get back out of services. And then they're struggling, whether it be taking meds, being able to have some of the support around them. And sometimes the cycle is three days. Sometimes the cycle is 30 days. But inevitably, you're back into it again, that we're inter getting introduced with police officers, with paramedics. We're putting them back on a mental health hold. So what we built is these system navigators, we call, that are really helping them like navigate the complex system. So once you get out of the crisis stabilization unit, what happens then? And our team is doing things that we've never done in Sonoma County before, which is taking people even to a doctor's appointment or connecting them with the doctors and with meds and being able to work with them when they get out of the hospital or the CSU to be able to provide that services. And we'll go through some of the stats uh, through that team about how incredible it's been about the amount of context they've been. So it was really a joint effort with so many key organizations and the Santa Rosa Police Department led the team and we still manage the team, but yet we have no staff who are actually on the team. Our uh, The only connection we have is the management, we pay for it, and um, our dispatchers handle all the calls and we'll talk about it. But the paramedics are, are through the Santa Rosa Fire Department and Chief Scott Westrope has been such a great partner from day one on this. The County of Sonoma provides the licensed mental health clinicians in kind for us. So absolutely free, they embed them on our team and that's part of the county's Measure O funds that goes toward that team. Catholic Charities, we contract it with them and we, they provide the homeless outreach specialist. Buckaloo Programs is runs as our overalls, our program manager, and then each one of our system navigators are through Buckaloo. And then also Humanidad Therapy and Education Services really help us with our Latinx community and specifically bicultural and bilingual uh, staff members that are embedded with our uh, system navigator team. So those are the key teams that would go. We'll go to the next slide. So one thing that was really important to us is setting this team apart from law enforcement. And Mary Francis talked about this, and I've really seen this in my work uh, through the police department and through this team, is there are many community members who, quite frankly, will not call for services. They will not call 911 if they believe that an armed police officer is going to come out, especially when it's a juvenile who's going through a mental health crisis, and they have a fear of, their, of some type of force being used. And so what we saw is they weren't seeking out the services they need. So we made sure this team, it has the team uniform. You can see it there in some of these pictures. They're wearing just the gray. They wear a gray polo shirt. They wear these gray jackets. The team van is just a white van that looks nothing like a police vehicle. We have that in response logo, and we really put a lot of thought into that logo. We worked with a local branding company called TIV Branding here in Santa Rosa. We went through hundreds of designs, hundreds of names, all these things, got a lot of feedback with it. But in response, the name that we came up with is, is that we're in response to a cry from our community for a different type of response, that the, the community, your voice was loud and clear. You wanted to see something different. And this is our response to that. We also put like the little O in there that you see, it's like these comforting hands. We used the color green because we didn't want it to be like blue, like a police, red, like fire. So we went with green, which is the national uh, mental health uh, color. We put mental health support team as our tagline underneath because we want to also keep the key focus of this team is on mental health, even though we, we certainly work with unsheltered population and with substance abuse. And we wanted to keep even support of showing like this team is there to be a support team to you. It's uh, like we talked about unarmed civilians, no weapons whatsoever. With it, they just have a radio on them and that's all they do. And a radio and a clipboard is all they carry with them. Uh, with it. And um, we're also would love to do, we can talk about later about setting up where people could take a tour of our building or our vehicles and be able to check out more than these pictures are able to capture. Next slide. So the scope of services, we talked about it. It's, it's always going to be focused on those in a mental health crisis. Now, one distinction we have to make sure we meet or clarify is they can't go, these are unarmed civilians. So they can't go to a suicidal subject with a gun. Uh, like that. And that's the reality that we get. We get calls on a regular basis of my son, daughter, husband, wife, 
They're back in their bedroom. They're barricaded. They have a gun that they got access to. So our team can't go to that call. But what they still do is they play a key part on it. So an armed police officer will have to go to that call because some of the officer safety concerns. But our in-response team can work with our officers, can provide them information, can get on the phone with the individual, be able to use their enhanced level of expertise to be able to de-escalate that situation. We have to also be careful when they're going to calls of someone who's extremely intoxicated or under the influence of drugs uh, with it. So that's something that we work with, uh, with it, but uh, making sure there's no weapons or violence involved with it. We will help out with some welfare checks. So we'll get calls like a welfare check for us is a common call of, I haven't heard from my mom or dad who's elderly in uh, weeks and our team will be able to go out there and help with some of those calls. Uh, the basic suicidal or self-harm calls, our medic can help with those as well. Uh, delivering death notifications, we we support our chaplains and others with it, but our chaplains still take the lead on the de delivering the death notifications uh, with it. We're, our system navigators are doing things like helping with the drug and doctor's appointments, and we're hopefully what we're going to also see is helping with some of our unsheltered population to be able to get into some of the services that they need. We'll go for our next slide. Another thing to really understand is, like we said, I, I just like to really stress this. This isn't; these aren't police officers, so they're not going to the the calls that take confrontation, or they're able to have to be able to use any force or anything like that. And another important one to understand is they have to be within the city of Santa Rosa. So this fund, this program was started with Santa Rosa general fund dollars, and it's only for the city of Santa Rosa. Sadly, we see people call from other areas in the county, Windsor, from Hillsburg, other places, saying. Hey, can you come? My daughter, my son are in crisis. And we say, no, we can't leave the city limits. And we have them say now, okay, I'm going to bring my loved one to Santa Rosa and I'll meet you at the police department or I'll meet you. I heard a call not too long ago where they were saying, I'll meet you at Santa Rosa Plaza at the hand uh, and I'm going to bring my loved one to you. So I take it as a compliment of our team, but also what it really tells to me is we have such a need to be able to expand teams like this across the county. You de deserve the same level of service, whether you live out in Guerneville to River or in downtown Santa Rosa. And uh, Mary Frass and I will talk in the end, we are seeing progress throughout the county, but it's it's moving slowly, uh, be able to do that. Next slide, please. So this is what's another really important. And one of our other slides we'll talk about, we have a dedicated line. So all calls are coming through our 911 dispatch center. And you don't have to be calling just for in response. So we do have a dedicated line of 707-575-HELP. And that's a dedicated line. It has a dedicated dispatcher. Uh, it has a different ringtone when it's coming into it. And they actually answer it as in response. And they're automatically providing you that information. And we have a lot of family members who have that number memorized. But one key part of doing it through our 911 dispatch center is now every call that comes in there is evaluated for this team. So we have community members who have no idea what in response is. They've never even heard about it. But our dispatchers are able to see that call and say, you know what? This is a better call for in response to go to than for an officer to go to. So last year we had over 250,000 calls come into our 911 dispatch center in Santa Rosa. So we're able to evaluate every single one of those calls, send the best resource to that. And then also our team, they, they operate off the same police channels our officers do. So they sometimes hear officers going to a call and then they self-deploy themselves and say, hey, I can go to that call and help out. And they go and help our officers. So they work really closely with the officers. Another important thing is they can call for emergency assistance on that radio if they get it over their head or if they have someone who's assaulting them. And it's something that we really work to be able to make sure provide them the level of services. But the biggest thing that's for us is being able to screen every emergency call we go to to see, is that a call that we could be sending in response to? And we'll talk about some of the stats that we've gone through at the end of the year. Next slide, please. So we started We started on January 11th of 2022 is the first day of service that we had with this. And Mary Francis was there. We did a big ribbon cutting at City uh, Hall there. It was a fun day. And then in 2022, we went to 2,800 calls that our team went to. So we were really excited. It was kind of getting, we were 10 hours a day. We started from uh, seven days a week from noon till 10 p.m. is where we started off. Then in October of 2022, we were able to do three days a week where we added a morning team, but we were still struggling with staffing. And then into 2023, right at the beginning of 2023, we went 15 hours a day. And that's where we're still at today. So from seven in the morning 
till five at night, we have a morning, a day team. And then we have from noon till 10, a second team. So they overlap in the afternoon for five hours during those peak hours. So 15 hours of coverage a week, seven days a week. And in 2023, we were so excited. We went to just under 4,800 calls for service that we went to. 3,600 of those calls out of the 4,800 were deemed to be in lieu of a police officer that a police officer would have been going to before. So that's really exciting to me because not only is it allowing officers to go to the calls that are more appropriate to their skill set and more designed with emergency calls going on around the city of Santa Rosa, but those are 3,600 calls where at the end of the day, we actually set a better trained resource to handle those things, has more expertise in handling a mental health crisis. You see, it's kind of spread out throughout the year pretty evenly with the calls for service. And um, now we're really focused on getting to the full 24 seven. So we're we're within months of adding a third team and that third team's gonna work from 9.30 at night till 7.30 in the morning. Uh, we're finally getting the licensed mental health clinicians hired, which has been a hurdle. And then now we're struggling to hire the medics uh, with that. Uh, with it. There's a lot of competition from different fire departments all over the place. So we're, we're working toward a goal of this summer to have the third team out there and be 24 seven. And then we think we'll settle in somewhere around 6,000 to 6,500 calls a year and around somewhere around 4,500 to 5,000 calls in lieu of a police response, which is really exciting to us. And uh, we're gonna continue to grow and continue to get the community awareness out about this team and also more proactive work this team can be doing out in the community. Uh, and this, these 4,800 calls right here are just for the van. So the in response van with the multidisciplinary team responding to it. The next slide is going to be separate stats for our system navigators. We'll go to that slide now. And these system navigators are the ones doing that follow up with our individuals, providing them that support. And what we really hope is by more this like upstream approach that we're reducing the chances of these individuals going into crisis again. So we saw they made uh, just over 2,600 contacts. And those were 795 unique individuals, meaning that some of these appointments, they're meeting three, four, five times with the same individual, providing them that support. But the, this is something that greatly separates our team, that you're not seeing any of the crisis response teams, or very many of them around the nation have this investment. But I think it's one of the most important parts of our team to be able to provide that support. And I think it's going to have the greatest impact in starting to reduce some of the calls and getting people some of the help they need, ensuring they're seeing their doctor, ensuring they're taking their meds, and ensuring they're getting the support they need around the county of Sonoma. And really, this is something that's not quite frankly the city of Santa Rosa's responsibility to do, but it's something that we saw a huge void in. It didn't really see a very clear roadmap for it being handled. So we jumped at the opportunity and are providing the best level of care that we can for our community members here in the city of Santa Rosa. Next slide, please. So these are the important numbers for everyone to have here. The 575 help is, is the alternative line where you can call directly for in response. But again, just reiterating that you can call 911 and ask for in response. You can call any of the Santa Rosa Police Department numbers, but the dedicated line for that. We also have a direct line that goes to our lead system navigator, and that's the 204-9756, and that's for some help. The other, other one just to get information about in response or to connect with a system navigator is the email right there, the in response at srcity.org. And that's a great one if you just want information and they can get back to, are you saying like, hey, this isn't an emergency. So they're not gonna automatically reply back to that email. But that's one of like, hey, this is someone like, we want some support for a loved one or my neighbor, or I see an unsheltered individual in my neighborhood who needs support. That email is a great one to do it. We also have a dedicated web page, which has a lot of information about our team. And I'll send, uh, I can send Karen, uh, to, we have two different videos that we've created on in responses that we can send out to your membership that provides a lot of like information that we've done about this. And they're both on our website as well. Next slide, please. So we went through that really quickly with all the things within response, because I wanted to leave more time for questions and answers. But at the end of the day, it's a team that we're really proud of. We're working with other communities across the Bay Area to kind of replicate teams and build teams similar to this. We have some other good teams. The Petaluma Police Department, Roner Park, Katadi, and Sonoma State are all co coordinating together through uh, a team they call SAFE, uh, Special Assistance for Everyone. It's a really good team. They were able to go to 24-7 right away. Um, some of the key differences are they don't have licensed mental health clinicians on their team, and they put the first aid clinician and don't have a homeless outreach specialist. 
But the benefit of that is they were able to go 24 seven right away because it's easier to hire. So there's pros and cons and we're kind of evaluating. We've been really working closely with the County of Sonoma so they can build out a team similar to us or all the unincorporated areas and other cities. And they're showing some progress on there uh, with it right now. They still have the mobile support team which is a little bit different where you have to, uh, they're, they're going, but not until a police officer has cleared the scene and their Mary Francis could talk a little bit more about their plan. But what we're really doing is continue. Our goal is to go 24 seven within response, hopefully by this summer. And then we're really working toward making sure that this team is sustainable for the future. So that's using, utilizing the county measure of funds, utilizing uh, federal grants. And we've been really successful in getting federal support to be able to sustain our team. We just built a brand new building for our team or didn't build a building, but got a new building uh, right there across from the police department at Brookwood and Sonoma uh, with it. So now our team is able to operate out of that. And right now they're actually building out a lobby for that. So we can have, it will be publicly accessible. So anyone in the community can come there, seek mental health resources. We put a huge in response team uh, sign on the front. So it's very clear to everyone. And that's gonna be part of our key things of like getting this team more out in the community. And so far, we've received such positive feedback from the community. Our police officers love the team because they they really see the expertise that this team's providing, and it takes some of these calls off of their plate. And they also see that some of the problem locations and individuals we've been dealing with over and over and over now is get, are getting some of the help they need so we don't continue to go out there. And then now what we're doing is seeing these people finally get some of the support that they need. So I'll turn it back over to Mary Francis for our last couple slides, and then we'll turn it over to questions and answers at the end. So I will just say that uh, Medi-Cal is the largest payer for behavioral health crisis services in the country. And so they have created a standard that is mandatory across, uh, I, I, I can't speak to other states, but the Department of Health Services for California has mandated that mobile crisis team services be made available countywide 24 seven. Um, they, they wanted it done by the end of 2023 and it's just been impossible because of the, of the shortage of, of behavioral health workers, basically. Um, so the, the state of California is cognizant of those challenges. It's not just in Sonoma County, it is across the state. Um, but um, the Department of Health Services for Sonoma County is mandated to, to implement this countywide system, um, and it is the Division of Behavioral Health that has responsibility for it. Um, they first were the Board of Supervisors has uh, approved a plan with some initial funding. Um, they first talked about being maybe, maybe able to implement this countywide system by this month. Um, now they're talking about April. Uh, it's all a matter of being able to hire sufficient staff, quite frankly. Um, the, and it, the mandate is to make these services uh, available to anybody that is on Medi-Cal. However, um, there is going to be no turning away somebody because they have a private insurance coverage rather than Medi-Cal or no insurance coverage. So the services are going to be provided regardless of coverage. But the federal government often makes Medi-Cal the initial payer in, and many of the standards are then down the road adopted by private insurance companies. But right now they're not. Um, private insurance companies are not required to pay for mobile crisis services right now. Um, you know, the standard for what these teams should look like is less than what you see in the in response team. Um, so I think that the county's coverage around the clock and countywide will not necessarily include a team that always looks like the in response team in Santa Rosa. Um, I do want to say that there will be a centralized dispatch, a single number. Um, there's going to be a, it will be a, staffed around the clock, um, but anybody in the community can either call that centralized number, which is not widely publicized at the moment because they don't have a, a workforce to back it up, 
Um, but somebody will also be able to call the in response team if they live in Santa Rosa, or they will be able to call the safe team if they live in Petaluma, Katati, um, or Ronit Park or on, or on the Sonoma State campus. Um, no matter where you live, or you can also call 911. There's a, this is complex. It's got to be worked out, but, but the centralized dispatch team will be coordinating with the respective mobile teams in different parts of the county if they exist. But what is so important is that it's going to provide some kind of access to people who don't live in these major population centers. Um, because we, we there's been long cries from people in North County, West County, in Sonoma Valley, who have simply not had access to the same level of mobile crisis response and are dependent still on law enforcement to respond to calls. And sometimes the law enforcement, the sheriff's office in unincorporated areas of the county, sometimes that goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. So there's still work to be done. And then uh, let me just see. And then I just, I, I don't have a lot of information about this, but but um, Measure O and a second annual report, I don't know if it's a second or a third was just released and is available to show how that uh, tax, um, which added a 0.25 sales tax, I believe in, in Sonoma County, how that money is being spent. And I just wanna say that there is a fair amount being apportioned off to uh, emergency psychiatric and crisis services. And John, I don't know if you have a breakdown or any more information to share, but um, I, I think that could also be paying for a, a bed for somebody that has to be hospitalized. I'm not sure. Yeah, Mejuro paid in 2022, Mejuro paid uh, just over $250,000 they gave toward it in response team. In 2023, they gave 512,000. And so this year we're still working and negotiating for what we'll get. And we're hoping since the city of Santa Rosa is taking the lead on this, we're hoping to see a larger contribution from the county on this to keep this team sustainable for the future. So I think we'll just um, always open to questions, either of us, but are, are there questions? Karen. Okay, as excuse me, as I mentioned before, if you could please put your questions in the chat <clears throat> and we will take it from there. Um, that will help us facilitate the questions. Um, thank you so much, um, Mary Francis and John. You guys yeah. are great. Um, so we do have a couple of questions I'd like to start off with. Um, if uh, Prop 1 ends up passing, and I think it probably is, um, what kind of how would that change um in response help hurt whatever um well john you can correct me but i don't think that that tax revenue generated you know by the what what has been called the mental health services act is providing funding directly for mobile crisis response am i right about that or? no it's not so it's going directly to the county so it is something that i leverage the county before saying hey you're getting all this money like that so uh, but the the bucket they provided us is out of the county the measure o fund but they they still get a significant amount of money uh through the mental health service act so uh Nami sonoma county uh we have a budget that's just under five hundred thousand a year we're, we're not very big but um just under half of our funding does come through the county and it does come through that mental health services act stream. Um, and I suspect with the passage of Prop 1, um, uh, we are going to lose perhaps half of that funding. Uh, we don't know yet, but uh, the, the Prop 1 changed the sort of designated buckets of money of, of how those funds uh, can be spent by counties. Um, and one of them, um, the bucket through which we have received our funding is going from about 37% of what the county receives in this tax revenue to about 17%. So it funds a number of local mental health organizations and there's just no doubt um, the funnel will be shrunk. So we'll see. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, and what about um, care courts? How would that impact or affect 
um, the services that you provide? I don't think we know exactly. You know, everyone's watching it. It's been implemented in eight different counties and they're just beginning to, uh, to gather experiences of how well it, it's, uh, it, how well it is or isn't working. There's a lot of educational information coming down the pike now um, um, for organizations like NAMI so that we can begin to explain how Care Court is supposed to work. One major difference is that Care Court will allow a family member to petition the court to consider their loved one who, um, who is in desperate need for mental health services and po and probably refusing mental health services. There is no such mechanism today um, in Sonoma County because we, we never adopted Laura's law, which uh, created a mechanism for family to petition the court to, to have them consider somebody for uh, um, a decision that that said they must participate in assisted outpatient treatment. We don't. We never adopted that as a county. So family members don't have that possibility of raising their hand and saying, "My son, daughter, grandson, whomever, refusing care, psychotic disorder, needs treatment. Will you please evaluate the person?" It won't be. There is a whole process. So it's not a matter of just raising your hand. If a family member initiates a petition then the court is going to bring in clinicians to do a thorough assessment. And the court, it's up to, entirely up to the court whether they determine that a person is eligible or not. Um, and all of the structure for how the court is to handle this, and this is a civil court process, not a criminal court process. Um, the thing I think that is really important if a family needs to resort or turn to this as an option to get a loved one help, the best thing they can do is document the number of times they've had to call law enforcement, the number of times their, their son or daughter or whomever has been hospitalized or in an emergency department. They need to carefully document that history to support their case for why this person needs to be, uh, why the court should order care. But at the end of the day, the care court, the judges, do not have ultimate discretion. They're never going to. They're never going to arrest somebody for for refusing to participate in a court ordered care plan. Um, and there's a process that assigns a voluntary peer supporter to the person, so that the person's voice about what they want for themselves will be heard by the court. Um, there's going to be, uh, you know, a, a, a clinician assigned to the case to help determine what the needs are and what the recommended course of treatment should be. But I think we just don't know yet. Uh, and people will still be able to say, no, I don't want to, I don't want to participate. Um, and so I think Governor Newsom and, and the administration is thinking, well, if they continue to pose a danger to the community or to themselves, and they were refusing to participate, even through the care court plan, um, then LPS conservatorship is always an option, but it's a steep bar to have anybody conserved um, for good reasons, you know, for historical reasons to protect people's rights. But um, I think the jury is out. We'll see. Thank you. Um, John, can you talk a little bit about the funding challenges for in response? You did mention, you know, um, the negotiation with the county around uh, the countywide measure O, um, to be able to expand and to attract uh, both uh, behavioral health workers who are bilingual and bicultural is a challenge, I know, and um, to be able to pay people a decent wage is a challenge. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's an important thing to use your voice, not only with the Board of Supervisors to make sure that they prioritize the county measure O, but even with our city of Santa Rosa uh, city council members about just that we continue to fund this and make sure this is sustainable. And we have incredible support from our city council and from the Board of Supervisors, but it's always still important to hear uh, from uh, community members across the city of Santa Rosa. Because right now we started off, the city put about $1.1 $1 million of general fund we got about a million dollar, just over a million dollar federal earmark uh, that we got. 
And then uh, we had the ARPA fund, the American Rescue Plan Act, that's really been sustaining this program, but those funds are running out. So now we're looking for some additional federal funding, but then looking for additional from the Measure O from the county, but then the city is going to have to end up handling the rest of this. And, and the city is examining how we're going to do that now. So for us, it's about $3 million a year for the full 24-7 response. And that's for all salaries, for our building costs, for our vehicles, training, equipment, everything, just over $3 million a year. But for me, it's some of the best investments we've ever made. And I think that it's 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 not just like just like Harpole is saying that we're saving lives. This team is going to save lives on the streets of Santa Rosa. It's going to reduce uses of force. Where it's going to reduce, I think, police shootings that you'll see in Santa Rosa. You're going to see more people getting some of the services. We're also looking at tracking some of the things like Mary Francis talked about. We have over 50% of our jail population right now in Sonoma County has a mental health diagnosis. So what we also want to see is a reduction in jail bookings that now instead of getting booked for low level misdemeanor offenses, that they're getting some of the mental health support they need. So uh, it's going to be important for us to make sure that we continue to have around this $3 million a year. And we continue to have the support from the county from the Measure O, but also providing the licensed mental health clinicians. One thing that Mary Francis talked about, so now we're, we're potentially this year, you have to go through the certification process, which we're doing right now, but to be able to have some Medi-Cal funds that help come that we can do. So we're in the early stages of that, but we're hoping to be able to use that to keep this team, this team sustainable and not have to draw down some of the county and city resources. So our we have a, our lead program manager from Buckaloo is working on that right now. And so I hope to see some progress uh, in that. But this could be actually going uh, be a, a topic of discussion with our city council in May when we when we elect our budget, because we're having some debate right now. Right now, we have what we call a limited term position for those paramedics uh, with it. And I want to I want to pull that limited term position away from that because it's making harder to recruit paramedics because they're like, well, limited term. I don't want to give up my job or somewhere else to come to a limited term position. So I'm trying to pull that away. But. Uh, the city council wants to make sure that we have assurances where the funds are going to come from. So we're hoping to be able to get that settled and pull that limited term position in the coming months with this budget cycle. Great. I, Thank will, you. I will just add that one of the uh, the drivers behind Medi-Cal insisting that Medi-Cal beneficiaries have access 24-7 countywide to mobile crisis services is that the services for Medi-Cal beneficiaries are going to be billable. Uh, and the and the rate is pretty good. So that's going to help sustain these services. But of course, they have standards which are going to have to be met, which show that the person has been connected to some kind of follow up care. Um, so there's a lot to come, but this is going to help future funding for these uh, in turn for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. Not necessarily. Yeah. Um, so um, we are, you know, if you like I said, if you do have a question, if you could put it in chat. If you're having a hard time doing that, we'll go ahead and do raised hands just in case um, people can't access the chat for some reason. Um, but uh, another question is, and you know, perhaps you covered this, and if you did, just tell me to go back and look at the slides. Um, what's your data on clients who are homeless? Um, what percentage do they make up of the in-response calls? I didn't Did actually that? cover that. And I could send you guys a, a document that has more of the breakdown because I have like probably an eight page document that breaks it down. Right now, it's been a lower percentage. We're not seeing that 60% like they were seeing in STAR uh, right now. Uh, but, but the way they break down the data right now is like, what was the primary? So what we see is a lot of combo that you see a lot of like homeless with mental health or substance abuse. So we're seeing a lot of combo ones and they put what the primary. So our primary... We're still staying like high in the 80 percentile of our calls that are like primarily of mental health uh, with it. But um, I'll send you guys the data that breaks it down in greater detail uh, with it. And we're right. also going to start trying to break it down. By, and we break it down by everything with age and gender and area of the city. And we're really trying to examine like where are our resources being deployed? And then also like, are we reaching everyone in the community consistently? And that's one thing that we're really working toward doing. Um. My guess is that other law enforcement agencies have reached out uh, to you to talk about adopting programs like this, um, probably throughout the United States. Um, have you seen Have you seen that? And if so, do you think that um, 
the success so far of in response will help with that? Yeah, I think so. I, I got invited to speak at the California Police Chiefs Conference in Sacramento and um, and was able to present our team to hundreds of other chiefs from across the state of California. Uh, we've also met Salinas, uh, really is building like an in-response team with it. So we've met several times with the city of Salinas as they try to kind of build a team similar to ours and help kind of. And so we've given them our policies and procedures, kind of like passing it on like we did with Cahoots. And like nothing's a secret for us. Like we're not charging other agencies for stuff. We're passing on because we want to see more of these programs throughout the state. And then working with some of our local agencies about uh, prodding, uh, like with the safe team and stuff. I would love to be able to see that actually use licensed mental health clinicians and things like that. So kind of prodding with some of them and some Marin County agencies to do the investment uh, with it and make sure they're actually putting the best trained resources out there in the streets. Great. Um, Juanita, you have a question? Can you unmute, please? Yeah. Yeah, I thought I'd raise, uh, put a chat in, but uh, somehow it didn't work. Uh, actually, I had two questions. The first is, I was just wondering, uh, how how is the safety going for these teams? Uh, I, I know that police officers are always in danger when they're in call, and I assume there's some danger for these people. So I just wondered how that was working out, number one. It's going well, but it's because we really like hyper analyze what calls we send the team to. Oh, okay. So they're, the dispatchers are asking about weapons, about how agitated the person is. And if there's any question about it, we still will send a police officer first just to make sure the scene is calm. And then they call quickly. But we haven't had any of our members assaulted. We have had them threatened, spit on, but we haven't had anyone seriously injured or hurt. But yeah. they're really careful with what they go to. And if they have to back out of a scene, that they will. They still, though, deal with a lot of trauma at this job. They've, they've uh, found multiple people who have been successful in committing suicide when they've done welfare checks or they've worked with people. So it's been still some trauma for our individuals on our in response team. But luckily, we haven't had anyone significantly hurt or injured or assaulted as of now. And we're going to continue to work to make sure that stays that way. That's great. My other question, and you've touched on this a little bit, and I know it's it's a difficult thing, but I'm wondering about the, I mean, this is focusing on in crisis. I, when you see a situation that you think is sort of pre-crisis, what can you do? I mean, I've called adult protective services. They tell me if there's not a threat, there's nothing they can do. So is there anything we can do for people that are not making an overt threat so much so that you think they're going to carry it out, but you're concerned that they may become threatening at some point. I think with our team, and Mary Frances can talk some things with NAMI, with our team is using those system navigators for that. So we have people who send emails all the time and say, hey, my loved one is struggling. I think they're starting to go down this path. What can in response do to help? So those system navigators might be able to reach out and yes. work with either that individual, with their family, with you as a friend or neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's so uh, emailing that in response at SR City or okay. reaching out directly. The okay. system navigators are the best. And then they also have access to the mental health system here in Sonoma County. So they might be able to say, oh, this individual has been seeing someone or they've been placed on holds in the past. So and, I know this individual has gotten called. In yeah, so I would try with those in, the, the system navigators, and they, it's a little bit limited what they can do when they're when they have it. They're not in crisis at that moment, but at least well, it's I, something that they can help coordinate. And Nami has a host of resources, even supporting like family members and even those individuals. So I'll let Mary Frances answer that. Well, I just say the same thing. We we do have a warm line, and we get about sixty five calls a month from people who maybe have somebody in their family or, or you know, that they're uh, connected to in some way who may be pre-crisis or has been through a recent crisis. Um, and some that's where our NAMI programs, we have an, uh, a class for family members and we offer ongoing support groups for family members. And sometimes just the ability to be in a group of people who get it who don't feel ashamed talking about, you know, our groups are non-judgmental. Um, there's a, still a, an enormous amount of stigma around mental health. And a lot of people don't feel comfortable talking about what's going on in their home or in their workplace or, or with a loved one who is maybe pre-crisis. Um, so that's where our programs can be very, very helpful. And people learn from one another often. 
And we certainly direct people to these crisis teams, including the in-response team and their system navigators. And we work closely with Buckaloo Programs, which has some really fine programs to one-on-one -on -one help people connect with appropriate services. But we just do a lot of explaining uh, and trying to redirect people toward resources that can help in addition to our own programs. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, a question um, a rep going back to the hiring, with the challenge of hiring um, qualified professionals, um, what can you do to attract them? Um, yeah, I know that's... it's, I mean, that's, I think that's every governmental agency everywhere, everywhere is asking that same question, but this is a particularly, I would, hard job I to put it mildly um so what can you do to attract people <clears throat> we're gonna we're just on the I had, we were talking about it just last week so we're gonna be doing a little like social media campaign in the coming weeks like kind of attracting so uh, for all positions for the mental health clinician the paramedic and for the homeless outreach specialist with it so we're trying to get the word out the problem is we're in such competition with like hospitals and there's a lot of places where the clinicians can work from home remotely and be able to do like zoom meetings and things like that and and then they're also not put in the danger our, our team as much as we try they it's they still do face a lot of dangers in the field so we're competing with that the people we get are people who really like have a heart to work for this and like want to be out there in the community and quite frankly they could make more money and be in a more comfortable setting. Uh, the opportunities are out there, but they do it because they have the heart to do it. So we're just trying to get the word out. So if you have individuals who you know who are interested in this, uh, let us know and we'll always be hiring for those positions. But look for it on social media and I can send you some things maybe you guys can share in your platforms that we'll be doing. They're, they're working on a little video and some talks about from all those positions that we'll do because, and unfortunately, We've seen it. it's actually a good thing. I mean, one of the things we talked about this when we created the paramedic position is we thought it might be a recruitment tool for our local fire department. And that's exactly what's happening, that we've had three of our paramedics have like promoted up and become firefighter paramedics with the Santa Rosa Fire Department uh, with it. So that's good. It's a new opportunity for them, but we hate to lose them. So we're, we're kind of also constantly churning through that. And the fire department's going to be hiring a lot more medics now with some of the new tax measure that has passed. Uh, with it. So we're kind of constantly in competition with that. Great. Thank you. So I think that's it for questions. Um, so I do want to thank you again for a, such a great presentation and such wonderful information. And um, whatever you send to us, we can go ahead and um, post somewhere. I'm not sure where, but somewhere. Um, and as uh, Leona said early on, uh, this was recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel. And if uh, you want to find out what else is happening with the league, please visit lwvsonoma.org. And our next monthly meeting will be April 25th and um, around uh, climate change. I can't remember exactly, Leona. Our, yeah, RCB, RCPA and your friend, uh, Tanya... Norris. Norris. Great. Okay. Yeah, I would also like to chime in. I really want to thank Marianne, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mary Francis and, and John uh, Cragen for their wonderful, very informative presentation. Thank yes. you so much for having Thank us. you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Have a good week, everybody. Thank, thank you. You too.